Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, your ticket to all things college football. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? Join us as we talk college football from the national championship to college rivalries to bowl games to the Heisman Trophy to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC College Football Podcast, brought to you by GSMC Podcast Network. My name is Ryan Lee, back here once again. I hope you continue to stay safe amongst the pandemic. We have got a whole bunch of very interesting topics for you, including some recent news in the NFL regarding just the overall landscape, some player movement, some players retiring, as well as a very different segment. I'm actually going to get right into this one because I actually love this segment so much. I, believe it or not, am actually a very big fan of not necessarily reality TV, but game TV. It's one of the reasons why I love sports. I just love watching how different games play out, the strategy behind it, the way people have to interact with each other. One of the first game shows I've really grown up on is this one show. I don't know if many people have ever seen it. Very popular. More in the early to mid-2000s was actually Survivor. The way that the players interact with each other, the way they have to talk, the way how they have to kind of weave their way through the system of the societal construct that's just 20 people stuck on an island together. And then you also have a bunch of shows that are a little more just your stereotypical game shows. Your Price is Right, your Wheel of Fortunes. But there's one in particular that has been making a lot of headway as of late and has really been put on the limelight, especially as of heavy, because of not necessarily unfortunate reasons, just not the most ideal reasons, and that's Jeopardy. I personally love Jeopardy quite a bit. It's actually one of my more favorites in terms of game shows, if I'll throw it on every so often. I'm always randomly guessing responses. Let's be honest, we all do that. Whenever you watch Jeopardy, try to guess some of the responses. Whenever you get those two to three, you finally get right. You feel like the smartest person in the world. You can feel like you take it on. And then you get kind of taken back to reality after the next clue. But the reason why I want to talk about Jeopardy in specific is because, at least in terms of its connection to the entirety of the sports world, the connection and the crossover, I guess is the best word, or the intertwining of those two industries have actually become very prevalent, especially because right now there is a lot of momentum being gained by the potential replacement host of Jeopardy. Ever since the passing of Alex Trebek, who had taken the role for so many years, you know, 36, 37 years he spent in the role of Jeopardy host before his passing all the way back in November, Alex Trebek, he was the guy. You know, no one could possibly even think about the idea of replacing Alex Trebek. And the reason why I even have this, I'll get to this in a minute, is because ever since he did, you know, pass away, he had, he had cancer, he had a long struggling fight, he held off the best he could for years, unfortunately, before the cancer took his life away, there have been many attempts to see who could be the successor, and I'm guessing at least for the time being, this was something that the producers and the show creators of Jeopardy never really wanted to deal with because they knew that 
as long as they had Alex, they were set. And then all of a sudden, you kind of have this run where Trebek kind of continues to go on to film the shows. However, there's this lingering feeling that it could be his last. And then eventually it is. So they've been having a bunch of people come in and guest hosting. And a lot of the people who actually have come in and actually have taken an opportunity to host and to guest host Jeopardy ever since. There have been so many names that have been thrown around over the past four and a half to five months. Because some of these names do have intrigue. And the thing that a lot of people, at least in terms of the public eye, do not exactly understand is that because of the circumstances that the show were really put on top of, they did have to do a little bit of scrambling. And every single one of these guest hosts, at least, I want to say maybe until the end of the summer, maybe until the end of the calendar year, they're test runs. They are essentially fill-ins to see not only who can run the show and who can continue to bring that energy and persona that was so beautiful, but also can continue to have that same bit of professionalism and that love for the game that really gets encapsulated just in the energy of the person. Now, there have been several of the guest hosts who I have actually watched clips of or watched whole episodes of who I absolutely fell in love with. Whether if it was due to context, whether if it was due to personal preference, whether if it's just something in their voice, I just really loved it. And in other cases, there were some that very so much the rest of the public, like me, I understood why they took the spot, but I just didn't think the fit was right. Now, every single person who guest hosts from Ken Jennings, who is the first one, to whomever is the last guest host they have for, as the trial run, they are all in automatic contention for the permanent role. That needs to be clear. They are automatically in contention to the permanent role. Now, with the only exception being of Jeopardy's executive producer, Mike Richards, he just stepped in because they couldn't find anybody to come and guest host within a certain time frame of the year and because they didn't necessarily have the ability to figure that out timing-wise because they were such a crunch schedule, he just said, I'm going to step in. I'm the producer, I know, but you know, as the executive producer, part of your job is to step up in the big moments. I will fill up the shoes and buy the rest of the recruitment team and whoever else who runs the broadcasts a little bit more time. I can buy them two weeks to line everything up. And they did. Now, with Ken Jennings, you have to think that he is the headmaster of who can actually take that role as of right now. I love Ken so much. He is the Jeopardy's greatest of all time, the longest run, without a doubt, with that show. If you're not thinking of Alex Trebek, you're thinking of Ken Jennings. Maybe him and James Holzhauser, who, by the way, I would love to see guest host. Side note, I would love to see James Holzhauser guest host. But they've brought back, who is almost without a doubt, the undisputed greatest of all time in Jeopardy. And I honestly loved the idea of having Ken Jennings on from the beginning of January to late February. And it just made sense to me. He's the greatest of all time on the show. He knows the ins and outs. He understands who Trebek is as a human being. He understands the work ethic it takes. He understands the way that the host of a show such a high profile talks, communicates to the players because he's been in the player role and now it just switches over into the hosting role 
which helps provide more insight. The reason why I mention that specifically is because think of who some of the top commentators are in any sport of any game. Who are they? Let's go with the A team of each broadcast for the NFL. Al Michaels in NBC, but then who was the color commentators? Oh, there were John Madden when they just went over to NBC, and then it gets flipped over to Chris Collinsworth, a Hall of Fame level coach and an ex wide receiver who is basically a giant analytics nerd. And then you go over to CBS. Who do they have on their top broadcast? They get Tony Romo, who is an ex-Dallas Cowboys quarterback. And before that, who did they have alongside Jim Nance and Tracy Wolfson? They had Phil Simms, Hall of Fame level quarterback. And then you go over to Fox. And I believe the entirety of Fox's tenure, the top team has been indeed Joe Buck and Troy Aikman. And Troy Aikman, once again, a Hall of Fame level quarterback. And then you go over to some of the other top sports and their top broadcasting crews. Well, you go over to the NBA, you had Van Gundy, who led the ESPN ABC broadcast for the NBA. Former NBA coach, uh, he spent multiple years in the leagues and he understands what the players are like. And then you go over to the NHL before the retirement of Mike Doc Emmerich, who is the top guy for the NHL on NBC, you get Eddie Olchek, a multiple year veteran of the NHL. And then you go over to Sportsnet, the CBC broadcast of the NHL. Who do you get? You get Jim Houston, but alongside him you get Craig Simpson. Multiple time Stanley Cup winning forward with the Edmonton Oilers. Teammates with some of the greatest players of all time like Wayne Gretzky and Marc Messier and Grant Fuhrer. Some of the greatest players of all time. Craig Simpson is one of them. TSN's broadcast of the NHL. Who does that go to? That goes to Gord Miller and Ray Ferraro, a multiple year veteran of the NHL. I can continue to go on and on. But if you continue to go on for most of these sports, who are some of the players within those top broadcasting crews? Even the B crews, who's there? Let's go to NBC, for example. Who's the B color commentator behind Chris Collinsworth? It's Tony Dungy. Multiple years in the NFL as a head coach, Super Bowl winning head coach. Those are like the reasons why those guys fit that role so well. Not only because they were in a role where the voice was already set, but because they have the knowledge, the expertise, the experience in the game to understand it. Not just necessarily from an outside eye looking in, but actually they can understand on the ground level. And that is why Ken Jennings being a former contestant, arguably the greatest contestant of all time, makes so much sense for him on potentially being that permanent host role. Mike Richards, as I mentioned earlier, he's an executive producer. He just kind of stepped in at the last minute, but he knows the ins and outs of the show. He understands what it takes to successfully run Jeopardy. He gets it. He knows it. He's done it. He's been there. He has done it the entire time. And then you get Katie Couric, NBC News' Today co-anchor. She has a two-week run of her own. I know Katie Couric had a lot of criticism, and I can kind of understand why. She didn't really encapsulate that same charisma and that same energy and vibe that the show had over the next 40 some odd years before it, she couldn't really capture it the same way guys like Ken did, the way Alex did, but at the same time, she had a very high bar to fulfill, and it was tough to put herself in those shoes. You know, she went for only two weeks in the beginning of March, and that was it. 
And then the later half of March, you had Dr. Oz, the host of the Dr. Oz show. Now, I know Dr. Oz had lots of criticism in terms of his role in the Jeopardy host. And he wasn't bad. He wasn't great either. He was very okay when I saw him guest hosting. I just think with Dr. Oz, there's just so many better options if you're looking for guys who are already in that TV industry. There's just so many better options. Dr. Oz is... He was good. Just nothing special, you know? Nothing pops up. Very average, middle of the pack. Like a Joe Flacco type of a guy. If I had to make a comparison to that sports world. Or maybe a guy like... Like Marcus Mariota, who seemed like a good idea at the first, but then nothing really special, nothing really crazy, if that makes sense. And then we get the next three names. And if I had to pick, aside from Ken Jennings, I do not know who the rest of the guest contestants are. They haven't been announced yet. And there's still more of them coming out and trying out as the next bit of time goes on. But if what I've been reading and what I've been seeing is exactly what it is supposed to be. Then in this case, this could be one crazy competition. I've seen many, many different names getting tossed around. However, I'm only going to go with the names who have 100% been confirmed. Or guys who have been already announced. Now the first guy I want to bring up. He hasn't hosted yet. But there's a lot of intrigue to this name. Because he does have a history on the show. He has won Jeopardy twice on Celebrity Edition. He knows the game like the back of his hand. He's very knowledgeable in terms of the entire industry of the entire world. Especially because in a lot of those instances, he's had to either read up or he's had to learn about it in real time. And that is CNN reporter and TV show host Anderson Cooper. Now... There's some intrigue behind Anderson Cooper, in my opinion. And that's just because he's another big TV name. And it's just because, unlike some of the other guys who have filled in, like Dr. Oz, he's a little more niche, possibly, into the whole thing of medicine. And Katie Kura could be a little more into specific pop culture, because I know that's what today is mostly about. But... That whole premise of his show, the subjects that they do, they're very based on world events, current events, as well as anything that happens in other industries as well. I know they don't just specifically dip into news, they dip into health, they dip into finance, they dip into business, sports, they dip into pretty much every single thing you can think of. And that's why having him as a potential guest host is a little intriguing to me, especially because he is one of the three or four really heavy hitters on this list. And I haven't really seen the public reaction of the announcement of Anderson Cooper potentially being a guest host, but me personally, I'm not opposed to it whatsoever. Now, the next guy who has been announced as a potential guest host is the lead guy on the NFL on Fox. He's been met with so much criticism during his time at Fox, during his NFL broadcasts, but he's still highly touted in the regard of the way he's able to present certain aspects. He has his hit or miss moments. I am not sure whether or not I like this guy. But it is respectable, the stuff he's been able to do. Coming from that broadcasting background, doing the NFL on Fox, doing the MLB on Fox, it's Joe Buck. 
Joe Buck as a host of Jeopardy. Now, even when it comes to things like the broadcast on Fox, I am not shy, to say the least, to bash on, I guess is the best word to use, or I guess kind of nitpick on a lot of the broadcast done by Joe Buck. Because he's had a lot of calls where you just look at it and you're like, what on God's green earth is this man thinking? Or you just think, this guy's just a robot. He's just saying words. Nothing behind it. He's not human because of the way he says things. Go look at the call he made during the David Tyree helmet catch in Super Bowl 42. Look at his call. I can think of other announcers who could call that better but no we were given that really boring lame call by Joe Buck there was another call where I believe the Philadelphia Eagles are on it's either a kickoff return or a punt return and the guy basically takes it from his own end zone to the 25 yard line and Joe Buck monotone just keep saying his name over and over again. Just keep saying Mitchell, Mitchell, Mitchell. Like a monotone, emotionless robot. And in a setting where it's very fun, it's very charismatic. Like, there's people involved here too in a setting, especially like Jeopardy. I'm not sure how Joe Buck is going to do, honestly. Unless he can bring some of that persona that he potentially bring in any way shape and form or if he's just kind of turned into this broadcasting announcing robot I honestly don't know how Joe Buck is going to do and I already know that according to public response it's not pretty on Joe Buck because they know about him they know about his track record I guess for lack of a better word and it's not a very good impression that left on the fans of the show Now, there is one confirmed, one host who I 100% know is going to be on the show. And I think out of all the guest hosts who have been on so far, granted, the only guest host we've actually seen so far, there's only five of them. But if I had to pick out of these fives, this guy on most people's list is number one or two. And he created so much buzz when he came around and started that Jeopardy job on that two-week run. And it was Aaron Rodgers. Yes, the Green Bay Packers quarterback. The multiple-time NFL MVP. The... Former Super Bowl MVP of Super Bowl 45, Aaron Rodgers. Now, Rodgers was so much fun in my opinion. I loved almost everything Rodgers had to bring to the table when it came to him guest hosting the show for his stint. And the reason why I say that is because if you've ever watched the clips of Rodgers during his time in... Jeopardy, he, you don't see it in his face, you don't really hear it in his voice, but he's got a big personality, in the first ever Final Jeopardy of his guest heir, of his guest host, who decided to kick that field goal was a response as Final Jeopardy, you need to go watch that clip, because it is such a funny clip, it's been all around the place when it aired, Or at least the day after it aired. But Aaron Rodgers reacting to one of the contestants on Final Jeopardy. Writing on the little board. Who decided to kick that field goal. It's so funny. It's so good. It's pinpoint precise. It's that fun banter. That interaction with the contestants. The similar way that Trebek would. Or that Ken Jennings at least did. Or in one of his final episodes, there was a 
category on sports champions. And it was a triple stumper on the Green Bay Packers. And then the next clue, the person gets it right. And he has like the wittiest comeback. But go watch it. Aaron Rodgers guest hosting Jeopardy. I believe it's called titles in sports is the category. On his last or second to last day as a guest host. Now a lot of people are making a big buzz about the whole thing with Aaron Rodgers in Jeopardy. Why? It's because he already has that name around him. That household name. That name where everyone just knows it and you don't even need to question it. You can ask most people who Aaron Rodgers is. Most people are going to know who you're talking about. There's that buzz, that excitement to him. An NFL quarterback taking the reins as Jeopardy. But also, there's a bunch of talk about how if he takes the Jeopardy job, it could potentially give the Green Bay Packers some leeway into reducing his salary cap and helping him build the team that Rodgers never got a chance to do. The way I see it, the Packers have been scared to build the team around Rodgers because Rodgers has a relatively large contract, at least in terms of the cap hit. But people think that if he takes the job at Jeopardy, the full-time gig, that he's got $12 million locked up and they could free up his $33.5 million and change it to $21 million instead. He gets the same salary. He has two passions that he loves. And that way it frees up some space for Green Bay to make some moves. I know Green Bay fans, at least when they hear that standpoint, they want Aaron Rodgers to get Jeopardy. But with some of these upcoming names coming up, especially some of these bigger figures in sports, you just have to understand what could potentially come with the future of one of the greatest shows and most enduring shows of all time that's all I got for that and coming up right after the break we're going to be getting into some of the latest in the NFL with not just necessarily with draft day coming up but more so along the lines of just how some minor shakeups in the NFL could have long term consequences for some of the teams and the players that's all coming up right after this Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. The potential for those hosts can change not only their respective games, but also the Jeopardy game itself. And now we can go into a little bit of just some news revolving the NFL. I'm a little sick of sticking. I'm a little sick of talking about the draft at the moment. I just want to give it a rest. Yes, I know it is 
about two weeks away. However, there's not really much going on right now, at least in that aspect. There is really a lot of the same stuff getting thrown around, speculation about what the 49ers are going to do with the number three overall draft pick, questions about whether or not the number four overall draft pick could get traded by Atlanta, whatever it may be. And there's just a whole lot of question marks regarding what is going to be going on. But what I do know is that there's a lot of changes going around in the NFL that actually are going to have some effect on the way that things shake up in the league. Now, what specifically do I mean by that? What I mean by that specifically is that there have been a lot of questions regarding players switching places, players moving places, all that type of stuff. One of them being one of the most feared edge rushers throughout college football during his time in the NCAA was South Carolina's Jadavion Clowney. He gets so feared, so revered, so hyped up, he becomes the number one overall pick in the draft, and his career is very okay. It's nothing extra special. It's nothing completely out of the park. He's had some good years, some up and down years, but he just goes over to Cleveland and signs with the Browns for a year, trying to find a way to more or less revitalize and boost up his career from what it was, which is, you know, nothing super crazy. And because of this, a lot of people are hyping up the Browns to be this championship caliber team. And I can understand why they're saying that. They made this huge leap last year. They had all of these free agent signings and moves over the last year who just look sneaky good. They make the playoffs, and then they end up going into the divisional round. They win a game. They go toe-to-toe with Kansas City. They had the potential to actually beat Kansas City in the divisional round, but then ultimately lost. And because of that, Kansas City actually goes on to the Super Bowl despite losing to Tampa Bay. Now, what Cleveland has done is just made a couple of small moves, which don't look significant in the moment, but in the long run can actually add some massive value to their team. Whether if it is adding a safety, whether if it is adding actually two safeties, two starting worthy safeties, whether if it's getting Jadeveon Clowney, whatever it may be, he's going to have a big impact on Cleveland. This puts Clowney on the opposite side of Miles Garrett, which almost immediately makes Cleveland a feared defensive line. Because you get Clowney on one end, Garrett on the other, and whoever are the two tackles, they're going to have their work cut out for them. Now, despite the fact that Clowney was injured for a large chunk of last year, the Titans didn't really get as much as they wanted out of him. But I think that's in large part due to the fact that they couldn't even get him healthy in the first place. And that has been the big question with Clowney ever since he's entered the league. Is his longevity and his health. Can he stay healthy enough to get enough value? Now there's been a lot of talk with Clowney at least. In terms of his ability to disrupt the play. To shake things up. Whether if it's getting in the quarterback's face. Or whether if it's giving him that quick little bump right after he penetrates the offensive line. Whatever it may be. What is the impact that Clowney has on the game? In terms of his abilities. Whether if it is getting a tackle for loss but not a sack. Whether if it is just getting a hand on the quarterback's field of vision. Whether if it's disrupting the pocket, whatever it may be. 
Clowney has that ability. He can do it. He has done it at the NFL level before. He's made a Pro Bowl. However, it is just not to the expectation of what you expect from a number one overall pick, especially on the defensive line. If I'm not mistaken, there have been many guys who have been taken top three on the defensive line before. You think of guys who are pretty much absolute world beaters when they're drafted in the top three overall at defensive line. If I'm not mistaken, in that same draft, Khalil Mack was drafted, I think, five or six. If I'm not mistaken, Lawrence Taylor was taken number two. So I get those high pedigree of defensive talent who were drafted that high who just didn't necessarily create that same amount of hype or buzz as Clowney did. And that's the big concern, is that can he still produce at that level? We still have yet to find out. And then you get guys like Julian Edelman, that long, serviceable slot receiver who make their impact on the game. Now, with Edelman in specific, for whatever reason, I've got zero clue why he keeps getting brought up as a potential player in the Hall of Fame. If I'm not mistaken, Julian Edelman hasn't even won a single Pro Bowl selection ever. If I'm not mistaken, Julian Edelman doesn't even have the statistics, not even close to some of the guys who are in the Hall of Fame. And there are many Hall of Fame receivers who I keep thinking year in and year out have the chance to make it, like this is their year, this is the year, and don't make it in. Reggie Wayne is one of those guys. Heinz Ward is one of those guys. The two outside guys of the greatest show on turf, Isaac Bruce and Torrey Holt, I think they're the guys. They're not the guys. But I can definitely say that, at least in terms of what he brought to the New England system, sure. He most likely deserves to be a part of that Patriots ring of honor. He is probably considered one of the best Patriots in recent memory. He definitely was a large part of that dynasty. What brought them to the promised land so many times over and over again. At least in that second run of Super Bowls. From 49 to 51 to 53. He was integral in that. However, during that time, he was never a world beater. Yes, he can do a lot of those gadget plays. Yes, he can make the big catch when necessary. And yes, he has a lot of very memorable moments and very memorable catches. And yes, he was indeed multi-talented. But then look at some of those other Swiss Army Knife guys who have had just as good, if not better, careers than Julian Edelman in terms of the accolades. Because in order to even get to the Hall of Fame, you need a chance at some of the best accolades in sports. You need some Pro Bowls. You need some of the in-season awards. Because they tend to really fall in line with a lot of those Hall of Fame guys. With Edelman, he just has the one Super Bowl MVP and that's it. And yeah, some rings, but tomato, tomato. Mostly focusing specifically on the one Super Bowl MVP. That's the one hat he's got to hang on his, on his pedestal. Not a single Pro Bowl, not a single All-Pro. That's my biggest knock on Julian Edelman as the Hall of Fame argument. It just doesn't fit with me. Something about that just does not sit right with me. Because of the fact that he hasn't really done as much as a lot of those other guys who have been recently inducted. Let me go through some of the guys who have really brought their impact on the game on the Hall of Fame level. Most recently, Calvin Johnson was inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame. 
spent several years in the league. He spent all of his time with the Detroit Lions. You know, so many great catches, so many great plays, especially with the the Lions organization who didn't really have much to hang their hat on. But at the same time, you line up Megatron's careers, take the rings out of it. Take Julian Edelman's rings and throw them out. Take the Super MVP and throw it out. If you put them up side by side, it's not even close who's the better player. Catches, receiving yards, touchdowns. It's not even close. And also the thing with Megatron is he had to be one of the key parts, one of the key components, one of the key cogs. In one of the worst teams in NFL history, Julian Edelman at least have the benefit of the system, the scheme, the chemistry that's built with the greatest coach and the greatest quarterback in the league's history versus a guy who played a Hall of Fame level on the worst organization in the sport. You have a category for guys who only performed in the playoffs? Yeah, then I'll give it to Julian Edelman there. But in terms of what he's done on the field, no way. And there's speculation that he's going to go to Gronk and Brady down in Tampa and run it back one more time, bring the band back together all the way down in Tampa Bay. It's not happening. He has been having more limited and more limited playing time as the years go on. Especially this past year, he was very limited in what he could do. He missed so many games. I'm not saying these two compare at all, but in some ways, yes, in some ways also no. But think of an athlete like, let's say Serena Williams, where she is so dominant in the front part of her career. One of the all-time greats in all of women's tennis. Still is, to be honest. However, over the past, let's say two to three years, She hasn't really had the same production, that same level of dominance she used to have because injuries have slowly and slowly derailed her just a little bit. Her level at which she's competing and the success she's been able to have has been relatively limited, mostly due to the lack of availability. She can't even make it to some of these finals and these opens. She can't even make it to the finals of another tournament. In some cases, she gets knocked out immediately because her injuries pile up, pile up, get worse, get worse, get worse. And essentially, the whole body just breaks down on such vigorous strain for just such a long period of time. We're slowly starting to see that with LeBron. He's just playing at such a high, dominant, enforcer-type level where eventually he's getting older, his body can't keep up to the demand that his availability and possibilities of playing are slowly getting limited. Right now, he looks like he's on pace to get back at the end of the season, but still. That is essentially the same thing that happened to Julian Edelman. He wasn't as dominant as guys like Serena or LeBron. Not even close. Not even the wide receiver game. Maybe in the New England wide receiver room, sure, but in the entire NFL, no way. But with Edelman, he at least had one thing, or in many cases, three things that most players can only dream of having, that most players are never going to get in their lifetime. He has three of them. He has the hardware. He's got them rings. He has the championships. He's hoist Lombardi Trophy alongside the greatest coach and the greatest quarterback in history. Is Julian Edelman a Hall of Famer? No freaking way. But has he had a respectable career? And has he done everything he can for the game and the city of Foxborough, Massachusetts? Absolutely. Enjoy your time, Julian Edelman. That's all I got for that. 
Thank you so much for tuning in for this installment of the GSMC College Football Podcast. Make sure to rate us five stars, like, and subscribe every single place you go. Don't forget to share us and find us on all your favorite social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, so on and so forth. And be sure to leave a comment. It helps us so much. And to subscribe to the show. We know you want to hear more of us. Don't forget to tune in next week. And for all of us here at the GSMC Podcast Network, this has been the GSMC College Football Podcast. My name is Ryan Lee. Have a great rest of your night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From football to basketball, baseball to MMA, and even soccer. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast.